Hello, folks. We're, we're live now on Jay Banks' first Google Hangout. And uh, we're sorry for the technical difficulties that we've had uh, over the last half an hour, but we've got those sorted out. And if you're joining us right now, we hope you can uh, see us and hear us and be with us uh, for the next hour for a very, very uh, important discussion about Sochi and the, uh, the uh, Circassians. And uh, let me just uh, little, do a little thing here. Uh, just a little introduction. My name is Carl Alto, and uh, the Sochi Olympics uh, opening is a day away tomorrow. There has been much criticism in the lead-up to the Games, including security concerns, Moscow's clamp down on human rights, environmental disasters in the making, cost and corruption, quality of construction, and so on. One of the competing narratives has been the story of the native inhabitants of the Sochi region, the Circassians. As we approach the 150th anniversary of their final ethnic cleansing and expulsion from their homelands, the Circassians remind us that their story needs to be told and understood also in today's context. The fact that their story continues to be ignored and or misrepresented by Moscow is a lesson for other nations that live and have suffered or are suffering under similar fates. Estonians, Latvians, and Lithuanians can relate to, their, to this tragic uh, legacy of occupation, human rights abuses, and historical denial wrought by an imperial Moscow. So we are here today to remember, and JBank is honored to offer this opportunity to join in this online discussion with the leaders of the Circassian community in the United States. And just as a bit of uh, background and introduction, uh, uh, this is our first JBank Google Hangout, as I had mentioned, uh, about 10 years ago or a little more, back in about 2001 and 2003, during the days when NATO enlargement was the hottest topic in town. We hosted live online web chats with experts. And now we look forward to continuing this tradition of interactive online discussions to bring our communities and networks closer and in in touch with relevant, timely, and thought-provoking discussions on important issues. We're very pleased to have with us members of the Circassian American community to help explain some of the issues and mysteries and lessons to be learned. I would point out uh, that uh, a number of them took part in JBank's 2011 conference to discuss the Circassian story in Sochi. It was also very interesting to hear about the No Sochi campaign, and we will get to that in just a moment. And uh, also, just before we get started uh, with this timely discussion with our guests, I'd first like to thank the Joint Baltic American National Committee, JBank, and its three parent organizations, the American Latvian Association, the Estonian American National Council, and the Lithuanian American Council for their support, and also especially to Lita Yugarta, who is producing today's program. So thank you, Lita. Now, uh, we will turn over to our guests, and we will um, go in uh, order of, uh, of how they're speaking initially, and then we'll have a, a more general discussion about, uh, about topics. Uh, one of our speakers, unfortunately, Fatima Tliz, will not be able to be with us here today. She was called away at the last minute, and we're hoping that Ed Yogar will still join in. And if he does, I'd like to say that Ed is the chairman of the Circassian International Council, which raises awareness and helps provide information about Circassia and Circassians in the world community. And uh, live now, our first uh, speaker uh, will be uh, Nart Sh uh, Shekim, who's a film and video professional and just wrote and produced and directed his first documentary film, 1864, The Circassian Genocide, which is uh, today, uh, if I understand correctly, is uh, premiering in, in uh, Amman, Jordan. So congratulations on that. And uh, before we uh, turn to, to Nart, also I would like to introduce uh, uh, Nart is here. And uh, hello, Nart. And then also uh, uh, Donna Wojcik is a Circassian rights advocate and founding member of No Sochi 2014. She's to your right on the screen. And, and to her right is Tamara Barsik, Director of Communications for the International Circassian Council, and a founding member of the No Sochi 2014 Committee. So with all that being said, welcome, everybody. Thanks for being here. Thanks for your patience. 
and uh, to our viewers for their patience. And now we're going to turn to Nart. And uh, Nart, um, who are the Circassians? And uh, why, why are we all here today? Uh, why is Sochi so relevant? So if you could just explain to us a little bit more so we understand. And some people may know a lot. Uh, other people may not know anything. So how would you explain that? Thanks. All right. Thank you, Carl. And uh, thank you, Lita and Jay Bank. Um, well, the history basically uh, starts basically with me. I mean, you grow up in an Arab country with a name like Nart. Um, everywhere you go, people is like, but what kind of a name is that? So immediately you feel like, okay, something is off here. If people are asking what kind of a name is mine, so it's not common, and I don't belong here. So you go and you delve into the history of your origins and where you came from, and you discover that we have this long, tragic history, and we do not belong in the Middle East. We belong in the Caucasus. That's where our people came from. And when you dig deeper into that, you realize that we've, we are the indigenous people of the North Caucasus, especially the North Central and the Northwestern. Um, and you realize that we basically, half of the North Caucasus was our tribes, our different tribes that uh, were living there free and since thousands of years, basically. Um, and, of course, throughout history there have been invaders, there have been people coming through the Caucasus on their way to Europe or vice versa. And, you know, people have suffered through all sorts of different uh, hordes, you know, Mongol horde, the Tatars, the, uh, and eventually the Russians. Um, so what basically you realize, you discover that um, there, when you look at the North Caucasus, you know, there's no mention of the Circassians. There's no uh, any uh, landmarks or any uh, thing that the people who go there c can see that there was a history there. Um, and this basically was the result of the, the, the years of wars that have been inflicted on the indigenous peoples of the Caucasus and the North Caucasus uh, that eventually culminated in their, you know, death and destruction and expulsion from that land. Um, and you discover that when you study the history, you, you're getting it in bits and pieces. Uh, I remember when I used to ask my mother about many things that happened, she, she couldn't say anything. She would cry, you know. So it wasn't easy for us, the, the younger generation, to ask our elders because it's something they didn't want to talk about. It was just too painful for them to, to, to say. Uh, so I felt, for me, it was our role and, and uh, uh, our uh, duty to tell the story, to say what happened, and just not to just keep ignoring it and just basically uh, take part in the cover-up that basically what the Russians have done. Um, and that's basically why I decided after, you know, having a career in this field of film and video, and I figured, you know, I have the skill, I have the knowledge, it's time to put it together and make this documentary to explain to people the background, the history, and how these people, the indigenous peoples of the North Caucasus, are no longer there. And the few who are there are the remnants of the, the wars, the death, and the destruction, and the expulsion. Uh, and the tragedy that of, of our people were, are, were all spread out throughout more than 50 countries around the world. And we're almost, our culture is dissolving, it's disappearing. And that, that to me is the most painful thing, is like, uh, by being spread out in all these different countries, you end up assimilating in whatever country you're in, and you slowly end up losing your own identity and your own culture, which is a tragic thing. Uh, so, but when you look at what's happening in Russia and what happened in the 1990s and the dissolving of the Soviet Union, people started to see a ray of hope that there might be something that might come out of this. Uh, you know, people might have some more freedoms and more 
uh, opportunities to say and uh, look into the history and be able to uh, visit, revisit that history and tell the truth of what happened. But unfortunately, that didn't long that didn't last very long, and now we're you know after Putin and what's been happening is like is we're we're going back to the old days of the empire, or of the Soviet Union. Uh, nobody wants to talk about anything. Nobody wants to uh, find out what the truth was. You know, it's just being just kept covered up, and uh, as it was throughout the history of the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union. So now it's more important to tell the story than ever before because I still believe that Russia's story has not, uh, has not stopped. It's, not, it's, not, uh, it's an evolving story, and it's going to continue uh, no matter what the Russians try to do or what Putin tries to do. The path to, I would say, um, I want to say disintegration, but kind of like... Uh, in the breaking apart of the Russian state or the federation, I believe that will continue to happen. It just might take longer to happen. Um, so to me, in order to understand the present, you have to go back and look at the history to understand why is what is happening now, why is it happening. Um, so that's basically my, my impetus, my uh, desire to do the film and do the documentary and tell the story uh, because something like this cannot be covered up. Um, and unfortunately, when you look at the history of Russia, there have been so many nations that have suffered under Russian rule and uh, Russian power. Um, and we are just one of these nations that have suffered. And that's why we need to be listed among the other nations that have grievances and uh, uh, issues with the uh, Russian power, or Russian influence, and Russian history. And I think eventually, uh, I believe that the Russians themselves have to come to grips with their history and recognize what happened. So, I mean, you can't just keep putting something, you know, putting it aside or uh, brushing it under the carpet and just forget about it. You know, pe we exist and other people exist and we cannot just be pushed aside and ignored. So that's basically my idea or my point of view that we need to reassert ourselves and we need to tell our story so that we tell the world that we are here and we exist and we are uh, intent on reclaiming our homeland. Maybe not in our lifetime, but eventually we intend on reclaiming that land. In a, and I must stress that we want to do this in a peaceful way. We're not, you know, we're not an organized army we're not you know we're not going to do this uh, through upsetting the normal uh, course of life but uh, i believe that it will happen and it will happen as history progresses and time and life moves along things will happen that will uh, lead us to reclaim that land eventually maybe our children or children's children we don't know but eventually i believe that will happen and we should be ready for that we should uh, prepare ourselves for that moment. Uh, it will not be a, ma a mass invasion of people, but I believe it will be a gradual thing where people will want to rediscover their roots and rediscover their history and go back to that land that you know their ancestors came from and maybe uh, rebuild it and make it into the paradise that it once was you know, uh, uh, hundreds of years ago. So that's basically my uh, push or my drive to do what I'm doing and continue on that path. Uh, thank, thank you, Nart. Uh, I should point out to all of our online viewers, too, that we've provided a couple of maps of, uh, of Circassia, where it is in the, uh, in the world, and, uh, and a closer look. Uh, those are online references. You can take a look at those. And uh, we'll also be uh, posting some other uh, relevant Articles, online online sources that uh, if you're interested in the issue, you can go back and 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 check it out in more detail. But I'm sure that now during the next few weeks, that we'll be, be hearing more and more every day uh, about uh, about Sochi and about uh, about the Circassian. So we're glad that we can be here with you on uh, on on the eve of this uh, of this very important important occasion. Historically, I, I should also mention out that. Uh, there, there is a Baltic, or more specifically, an Estonian connection, because once the 
uh, final battle at uh, Krasna Poliana, where the skiing events are taking place during the Sochi Olympics. Uh, once that um, final battle took place and, and close to the very same area, uh, the, the area had been depopulated, and, and the Tsars brought in new settlers, basically, to uh, repopulate the areas that had been um, uh, liberated of the Circassians. And, and Estonians even came down. And uh, even in Apazia, there were four Estonian villages just, just across the border uh, where um, Estonians lived for, for over a century, uh, 120 years until the, until the wars in the early 1990s. When um, when they came back to, came back to Estonia, so uh, we um, and, and I think I might have even had some some ancestors who uh, who were part of that migration there. We don't know uh, exactly, but uh, but uh, I have a I have a feeling that there's this innate inner attraction to the area for me, and that might be one of the root reasons. Um, I, I wanted to turn now to uh, to to both uh, Donna and to uh, Tamara. The Olympics are starting tomorrow. But uh, you've been preparing yourselves now for years, many years, and, and, and during the Vancouver Olympics, even you uh, uh, had, um, I think your No Sochi campaign was already in full swing by then, and you've been working very hard for the last four years. So this is now sort of the culmination of all this work. I, I know it won't end when the Olympics are over; you'll, you'll continue. But but how did, how did that all get started? And uh, and and uh, growing up here in the United States, uh, what what were your uh, feelings about being part of the community and what, what were the turning points in, in knowing that, that you had to do this. So I uh, wanted to hear more about that um, and uh, tell us about that. Well, I'll let Diana introduce the, the how the campaign came out a little bit and then I'll get into more of the politicizing of the campaign and I guess we can both discuss uh, what it feels like to be an American Circassian today. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Carl, and for the rest of JBank for putting this together. It's an extraordinary um, platform for us to be able to speak about these issues and just creating the space so that we could discuss this and share it with all our friends across the world. It's, it's a really great opportunity. That being said, it is the eve of the Sochi Olympics, and we are... Uh, yes, we have been at this for about four years now, but more... I think it's been seven years since we've been, uh, since Circassians all over the world have been opposing these games where our friends in Turkey and even our groups here send letters to the IOC before the selection of Sochi and even after the selection of Sochi just to alert them like please don't put the games here this is a uh, sacred ground for us and it is the site of our national tragedy and but of course those letters went unanswered and were ignored and brushed under the table, and so we mobilized. We, uh, ever since those years, and every May 21 since then, we've held up signs saying no Sochi Olympics, and it has really fostered some kind of national awareness around um, our cause, and even brought some kind of a reawakening amongst Circassians today. And so since then, and our first public protest was in 2010 in the, during the Vancouver Olympics, and we have garnered so much media attention, so much attention from countries such as the Baltic States and many others. And we are very grateful that this attention has been brought to us. But it is because of this thing that's happening, that's occurring tomorrow, and that is the Sochi Olympics. Um, for the last, I would say, 20 years since the fall of the Soviet Union, Circassians uh, like Nart um, uh, said earlier, have sort of been reawakened to the idea of, okay, well, all these nations around us are getting independence, they're getting statehood, you know, what's the next step for us? Um, and throughout the 90s, what you saw, especially during Yeltsin's era, um, there was a lot of push inside the caucuses especially to talk about things like the Circassian genocide, to talk about the Circassian question, where are we going, what's going to happen to us. You know, inside the Caucasus today we have three Circassian republics, and two of those republics, the parliaments of them, in the 90s recognized the tragedy of 1864 as genocide. So two parliaments within Russia, if you can imagine that, during the 90s. There were also organizations formed that were focused on getting genocide recognition, that were focused on, you know, the Circassian question and Circassia someday. But what ended up happening 
when Putin's regime came in is all of that got shut down. Now, what I'm saying is these organizations didn't shut down. They became infiltrated with FSB, and so the direction of the Circassian question disappeared for a few years. In 2005, Russian archives started um, you know, coming up uh, and appearing that pertained specifically to the Circassian question and to the genocide, and that began a small re reinvigoration in the nation. Um, inside the caucuses, they submitted those archives to the Kremlin and asked for recognition. Of course, the Kremlin came back, as they always do, by either silencing us or denying it, by saying that you were not a part of the Stalin deportations. Well, that wasn't our question to begin with. That was 50 years prior, okay? So, in 2007, when the Sochi Olympics was chosen as the location, all of a sudden, you saw these small Circassian organizations begin to pop up everywhere. Our traditional organizations are mainly focused on keeping communities together, helping people in the diaspora not to assimilate, um, putting a focus on our extremely unique culture and our, our own Shabza, uh, which is a Circassian etiquette that we all follow. Um, but what you started seeing was the emergence of political organization. We became um, a little bit more politicized at that time and through the years what we've been trying to do using Sochi as a platform it's been an extremely important platform for Circassians not just because of the um, awakening that's been happening uh, across the nation but because this social movement has been able to allow us to expand a political base and to create enough pressure to really make solid and social changes in Russia. That's what this whole thing was about to begin with, okay? Creating a leverage so that we can move forward and focus on the issues that really face Circassians today. And what are some of those issues that we're talking about? Yes, Sochi is an immoral place to hold the Olympics. The IOC should have recognized that. The Russians should have never chosen that particular place. We were killed there. We were exiled from there. It's culturally insensitive to pick a place like that. But today in the world, okay, you have nine out of ten Circassians living outside of our homeland, Asia. And that is specifically due to what happened during our genocide. Okay? So every uh, Tamara, I'm sorry to just interrupt for a second. Uh, I, I, uh, can you just explain how many, how many Circassians are, are, are there? How many, how many uh, are in exile now? How many are living in the homelands? How many in the U.S.? Sure. So basically, our diaspora is um, estimated to be anywhere between five and six million on the outside. Okay, we have a base of seven hundred thousand living in our historical homeland today. Okay, divided into I'll say there's three Circassian republics, but they're divided into four republics in the caucuses. Now in the U.S., we have a population of about six thousand here in New Jersey, and I would say. Uh, 3,000 more scattered across the United States with the community in California as well. In Jordan, you have anywhere around 70 to 100,000. In Syria, 100,000. In Israel, we have about, I would say, another 6,000. But the majority of our population today resides in Turkey. And you have anywhere up to 5 million Circassians living in Turkey today. Uh, and also a really significant amount of Circassians living throughout Europe, particularly in Germany. So what you find when you're going through, you know, these diasporas, as I did myself between the years of 2008 and 2010, I did a lot of traveling at that time. And I did a lot of soul searching at that time. You know, I'm a young Circassian. I was going through some age 20s, questioning a lot of things when I moved back home from college, especially about the community living here. I could see that our language, you know, is in danger. I could see that. You know, the youth is becoming more and more assimilated, and I thought, to myself, is this an American thing, or is this happening everywhere else? And I can tell you, this is happening everywhere, okay? We are assimilating at a very rapid pace in all of the countries we live in today. And the sad part is, it's also happening in our homeland. There are Asians living in the caucus today who do not speak our language, if you can imagine that. Because it's hard for us to imagine that. We hear that it's unbelievable to us. So what the Sochi has done, what the Sochi Olympics has done, what the campaign for genocide recognition has done, 
And thankfully, this has all come at a time where social media has blown up in the world, okay? So we have the opportunity to connect each other in a way that we've never been able to connect each other before. We've been able to reinvigorate this circadian question. We've been able to reinvigorate a national identity, okay? And what we're doing today is building the blocks for a national movement tomorrow. And hopefully, with the help and with the work that we're doing, you know, we're on an international platform now. We're speaking with different nations. We're speaking with different organizations. We're speaking specifically with different peoples who suffered under the Russian regime, under SARS, Russia, as well as communist Russia, just like the Baltic nations. And we're trying to form friendships and alliances. And we're trying to learn from each other and see what we need to do next. Thank you. I uh, just had a little um, <clears throat> little difficulty hearing you there at the end, and I uh, wanted to mention uh, maybe if anybody else had, uh, had a hard time hearing, uh, if, if you have a chance to uh, hard hardwire yourself in, it, it might help a little bit. But um, uh, that, um, uh, and, and also, I just noticed you have, a, you have a great map in the background there, too. Uh, so you've, you've, you've come very, very well prepared uh, for, for this. Uh, if, uh, if you also wanted to mention, I know that uh, just recently you've, you've been uh, up on Capitol, uh, Capitol Hill um, appealing to members of uh, Congress. Uh, you had a letter writing campaign. Uh, you've had uh, regular protests, but tomorrow, uh, on, on, on Friday, the opening of the Olympics, uh, you'll have a, a very uh, a very large protest, it looks like, uh, in, in New York City. If you wanted to mention more, more about that, and maybe to the listeners, anybody who's in the New York area, is interested in stopping by and um, uh, demonstrating with you, uh, where would they have to go? I know some of the information we'll, we'll be happy to post online on the uh, <clears throat> on the Facebook page, um, uh, and, and and also wanted to mention that that Nart's film, uh, the trailer, we've, we've also posted already. But but how how do people get um, more involved? Uh, how do they find out about about your events, especially over the next few weeks? Well, over the next few weeks, um, our big protest is going to be tomorrow, and it's not just in New York City, where we'll be protesting in Times Square during the opening ceremonies as they flash across the, the big screens in the state. Um, we'll be also, we also have groups in Amman, we also have groups in Istanbul and London. Um, just the other night, I met someone in Tokyo who said that they'll show some sort of solidarity. We have groups in Moscow also. So we have very awesome supporters all over the world who are going to be holding on those Sochi slogans, those Sochi uh, um, images, and so that is really important because everyone in the world should know who, who these patients are and what is really happening at the Sochi Olympics. That being said, that's going to be tomorrow, but in the next few days, in the next few weeks, as the Sochi Olympics is coming up, we are asking anyone to tweet to comment on any news article that may not have mentioned this occasion issue and just get the word out there because the online platform is very important to us. It is how we organize, it is how we get the word out, and this is basically the only voice that we have going forward. So basically tweeting at athletes, tweeting at journalists, and uh, commenting on any news articles that come out there is really, really important just to push our message in the and um, I just want to make a, a point before we um, move on. 2014, the 150th anniversary of our nation's demise, our exile, and our genocide. Okay, so to, so this year, 2014, is a very historic year for us. Um, not only did the Social Olympics happen, uh, in, you know, in our homeland, but what we're planning to do is really push for genocide recognition, okay? We're going to be lobbying as much as we can. We're going to be talking to many people as we can, and we've already begun this process. The next few months, you are going to see that different nations come out in recognition for our genocide. We've already had the nation of Georgia come out and recognize our genocide, and we're also very focused on today's real issue which is the human rights abuses that are happening in the Caucasus to our people, but also the human rights abuses that are occurring to our diaspora living in Syria today. We have been talking 
all day and throughout this conversation about the historic, the historic. But right now in Syria, there are more than 100,000 Circassians. Okay, they are the only European minority living in the country, and they are being targeted. Okay, they are being targeted because they are moderate, because they are nonviolent, non-threatening people, and they're being forced to choose sides. So when this happens, what you begin to see is deaths occurring. Now, hundreds of Circassians have already died in Syria, and there are thousands of refugees, both in Jordan and in Turkey. In Turkey, they're living in camps. And if you can imagine, 150 years ago, when we were exiled from Circassia, okay, they were living in camps. So we have come full circle. Across the sea, the Black Sea, there's a $51 billion party happening, and the indigenous people aren't allowed even into their country. So for us, it's a really big focus to get these current issues out on the table. You know, in two weeks, Sochi will be over, but we want to make sure that the activism doesn't stop, that we are able to help these people, that we're able to help all of the um, Circassians in diaspora. We would love the right to return to our nation, to start a repatriation program. So these are the kinds of things we're going to be working on in the next couple of years. Have uh, have any of you visited um, the place of your of your ancestors, Circassia? Uh, the my most recent trip was when I was two years old. Um, however, I do have I have heard stories of people who have gone back, and they are very glad that they have. But there is a sense of fear because they cannot speak as freely as we can here in America and other places because these issues do affect them as well, but they cannot speak out because of the way that the Russian government is set up and they're just not going to allow it. And so we in diaspora have taken it upon ourselves to be that voice because those people in the homeland are essentially voiceless. I've been to the Caucasus multiple times, but unfortunately because of my... Um position on uh, what's happening today in the world to Circassians. Uh, let's say I'm not allowed into my homeland at this moment, but, you know, things change. Uh, Nart, what about you? Um, I haven't been. Uh, my parents have, and they've been there numerous times, and they love it there. But I've always felt like going to the North Caucasus is, is going to an occupied land, occupied territory. So I never felt like there's freedom there, and I feel very uncomfortable going to any place in the world where your personal freedom is jeopardized, and in uh, you know you, any moment you could be locked up, you could be uh, you know uh, beaten up. Who knows? I mean, it's just I've never felt comfortable with uh, being in, in under uh, uh, Russian authority, basically. So I've never been. So. I think uh, I, I think as for me, I, I can appreciate that as a as a Baltic American, as an Estonian American, because during the uh, Soviet occupation, that uh, many people were very hesitant hesitant to go back because it was occupied territory. They they weren't free countries then. Uh, although the difference, I guess, is that it was just a generational or two generational difference. And, and many people, as 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 we did, we had relatives who lived back in Estonia. Uh, your distances are greater. Uh, with uh, with your homelands, but your perseverance is is very striking. So uh, I think there there are lessons to be learned there as well. Uh, tomorrow, I know that a number of years ago you visited uh, the Baltics, uh, Estonia. Uh, I, I know um, I know that you were there. Uh, what was that all about? You know, I have to tell you, from the moment I you know got off the plane and I stepped foot in Tallinn. I didn't know what to expect in Estonia. You know, I was thinking it was going to be very post-Soviet, very, like, communistic buildings and everything. And I have to say, what the Estonian people have done in the last, you know, 20 years is an amazing feat. You walk into Estonia today, you walk into Tallinn, it is a major metropolitan city. It has Estonian culture and Estonian um, tradition written all over it. You don't get any of that communistic feeling whatsoever. You don't get that Russian feeling whatsoever. It's purely Estonia, and I have to say, I really congratulate the Estonian people for being able to do that in such a short amount of time. Um, for me, going to Estonia, 
it was one of the most significant moments in my entire career uh, working on these issues because it was the first time that I really felt that we can do this. You know, Circassians can do this. Someday, you know, Sochi can be Tallinn or, you know, Nalchik will be Tallinn, you know, and I kept thinking to myself, look how much they've accomplished and they did it all in non-violent way in a harmonious way. You know, I saw Singing Revolution. I thought it was an amazing film. You know, you read the history. I met many of those peoples who were involved in that process, you know, in the early 90s. Very inspiring people. They gave us so much advice. When we were there, we were able to meet with the parliament. We were able to give our, you know, narrative and ask for a couple of things. And people were just so helpful. Um, we were able to speak on national television and let our story be heard, and the response was just really overwhelming. We also, on that trip, were able to visit the European Parliament and speak to different European parliamentarians. So it really helped us begin this process of reconnecting with Europe, you know, because we had already been doing that um, in the United States, kind of connecting here. but. Having that friendship in Estonia, having um, the people there assisting us and kind of showing us the way, saying, you know, we've been through this, we know what you're going through, uh, we know what you'd like to see, and we know you want to do it in a nonviolent way, we know your aims are noble, so let's see what we can do for you. And for us, um, we've been very lucky because the population of Circassians that are living in Germany as well have become extremely active. and. Um, Actually, one of the major party members of Germany, leading the Green Party of Germany, is a Circassian. And he recently came out publicly condemning the Olympics because of the Circassian question. And so, you know, this is just pushing us forward all the way. And we're very excited about that. So Estonia was our step into Europe, and we're so thankful for that. Well, I know I know the Estonians talk about the singing revolution. I'm one Estonian who cannot sing, or I'd like to sing, but I, I would I would, I would insult you uh, if, if I did. But uh, but the Circassians can dance. I've seen Circassians dancing, and it's 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 fantastic. And and with my colleague Lita this morning, we were talking about asking ourselves, uh, you know, what is what what do Circassians eat? What is your national cuisine? Uh, what is uh, uh, what do you have for breakfast? Uh, maybe Nart, listen, uh, what's on your menu? Well, I mean, Circassian cuisine is quite uh, diverse, uh, but uh, the fact that we come from a cold climate, so, uh, you know, everything is very hearty and uh, very nutritious, but uh, it's, uh, it's designed to sustain you for uh, quite a long time, especially in the cold. Um, uh, I mean, we, we our national dish is the uh, it's called uh, ship's pasta, which is essentially uh, uh, it's in the Caucasus it's millet, you know, it's uh, cooked um, and it's made into these you know wonderful blocks. It's kind of like uh, it's a grain, um, and you have this delicious walnut sauce that you pour on it, and it's usually eaten with. Uh, uh, you know, uh, grilled chicken or boiled chicken, whatever. But it's the combination of all of that with some a little bit of hot sauce as well. Um, it's I. The funny thing is, when I was a child, I did not really care for the pasta much. I just loved the you know d dipping the, the the sauce, the walnut sauce, with bread and eating the chicken. But as I grew older, I become to appreciate it much much more. And now I, I, I mean, I appreciate it so much that now I could cook it for myself if I want to. Um, but it is the kind of food that, as the Americans would say, sticks to your ribs. <laughs> um, and it is, it is, it's, it's a wonderful. It's a very, it's a healthy dish, but it's, it's, it's one of, uh, that kind of dish where it's, it's geared for you know cold climes. So uh, it's, it's really just going to give you so much energy and it just fills you up. You know? So it's just like it sustains you for quite a long time. So, and that's basically what the food was in the Caucasus. It's, 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 it's um, very, uh, uh, there's lots of, uh, you know, wonderful fat, you know, natural fat in it. Uh, you know, butter and ghee and all that, these wonderful things. But because of the cold climb, it just, it's designed to keep you warm, you know. So, um, <laughs> of course, 
in the diaspora, that changed a bit because now we're in the, we're, we're, di we're in different climates. Yeah. You know, so especially in the Middle East, it's much warmer. So uh, certain dishes we only eat in the winter, but now it's like it's become much more contemporary. Um, uh, but my mother was was a wonderful cook, and she was she would always make all these wonderful dishes for us, um, circassian dishes. And uh, I know I uh, later on in life, when they became older, and I started taking care of them, I started to look for my mother's recipes and learned all these wonderful recipes. And now I pretty much cook most of what she used to cook, and uh, which I consider a treasure because it's 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 like I'm I'm holding on to the the, the culture, you know, even if from a food standpoint, but I'm I'm keeping that alive. And now it's like when the family gets together. I'd cook all these wonderful dishes that our mother used to cook, and in her memory, and it's you know it just brings back all these childhood memories that all of us used to have. So to me, it's a very precious you know thing that it, it's 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 unique, but at the same time, it's it's so wonderful because it just keeps the tradition going. Well, uh, I think we'll have to come over for dinner sometime. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so, uh, I uh, you know. Again, the ba uh, the Baltic countries. They're on the they're on the Baltic. So so there there there's a lot of um, uh, fishing going on and a lot of uh, history around uh, around uh, seafood. Um, although although for many years during the Soviet occupation the borders were closed, so you couldn't get out onto the water because uh, I I think Moscow thought that you might be uh, you might be leaving them. Um, but um, uh, last week when I, I was reading a l little background. And and about um, about seafood in the re region, I I read this this really sobering, really terrible thing that uh, uh, Circassians uh, would would not eat fish from the Black Sea uh, because of the numerous uh, hundreds or thousands of Circassians who uh, had um, had died or um, had were in. Uh, ships that sunk during the during the um, you know during their ex exodus um, is uh, is that uh, something that that, that you've uh, that, that is common knowledge in the communities uh, what what can you say about that maybe I'll turn to um, Donna and, and Tamara yeah this is something that has been passed down from our grandmothers um, we're not big seafood eaters um, as you can imagine um, when we were children we were all told the same story um, you know the stories we were told as children were tragic ones they were heartfelt and you could see the pain in the eyes of our grandmothers and grandparent uh, grandfathers and you know they didn't have much detail um, sometimes in terms of why things happened, what was happening at the time. They're simple people. All they knew was, you know, they were forced out and their families were killed. Um, but along the way, when they were being deported from the Black Sea, you know, thousands upon thousands of people drowned in the water. And so for our people, the idea of uh, eating fish that ate our, you know, grandparents is um, a horrifying thought to us. So it's been something that's been passed down, definitely. Um, you know, and I just want to touch upon the idea that, you know, these stories, this storytelling, you know, was the only thing that really um, kept the memory alive for a long time for our people. But we're extremely fortunate that, you know, now if I go onto the Internet and I type in, you know, something historic. I can read, you know, books that are from the 18th century, uh, 19th century. I can look at maps from those times and I can see Circassia prominently featured, you know, and so many archives are being uncovered every, you know, every year and we're able to do a lot more research into our history and not from some outside spectator, you know, the, the things we're learning about today are coming from the mouths of the people who committed the crimes. It's very detailed, very interesting stuff to read about, and it's really building a new national narrative for ourselves. You know, and um, a lot of people ask me, you know, what's next? You know, you continuously talk about the historic and the genocide, and, you know, you use Sochi as a platform. And I want people to realize that there's a lot coming up. You know, this was the platform, this was the springboard. The real work starts now. You know, 
this last seven years was a primer for our nation. What we've been able to do is set up networks and um, be able to communicate with each other a lot better. We now know, you know what works, what doesn't work, how to reach out to different peoples. And I think the most important thing that our people, especially in diaspora, need to realize is you are a power in the nation you live in. So please, you know, get more involved politically, you know, reach out to your state that you're living in. Don't be fearful. In a place like Jordan, for example, you know, we're so loyal to the king. We helped develop the country. The first king of Jordan stayed with Circassians. We're still National Guard. We're his personal private guard. We've done so much to rebuild the nation. You know, I feel that if, if they reached out softly to the king and asked for his you know, um, uh, for his were for his support at this time to say something about the Olympics. I think it wouldn't go on deaf ears. You know, and I feel the same way in Israel. You know, we've been a very good part of that community. You know, Circassians um, actually are in the military in Israel, so we've been a very supportive part of is uh, Israel's balance these days. And I think that they could do the same thing in a place like that. Turkey, you know, we're a huge population there, so why not reach out? Why not create a Circassian political party? You know, the Kurdish people have one. There's also a lot of minority rights issues that we could be focused on. Um, for us, we really want these countries to look at the successes that have occurred in Germany and the U.S. in the past couple years, you know. We took it upon ourselves, we reached out, and, you know, our congressmen are responding positively. In Germany, you have the head of a political party, you know, condemning the Olympics. And so, you know, the power is in our hands, and I really hope that over the next few years you see that in these countries where traditionally our people have been living under a lot of, I would call it like a fear grip almost. You know, imagine living under a regime like Syria or living under the nationalistic rule of Turkey 15 years prior to now, you know, it wasn't easy for them to, you know, speak out and talk, especially in the caucuses where the Iron Curtain was up. And so I think people need to realize that in the caucuses today, you know, it's still very difficult for our people to say things. You know, just a few weeks ago, uh, a group of men, uh, about 12 guys who have been active with us for a really long time, voiced their opposition to Sochi through these years, they were arrested, you know? And so we are their voice. We are the voice for the voiceless in diaspora. So it's very important that we continue this work and represent, you know, our national aspirations and our hopes for the future. And just to piggyback what Tamara said, it only makes sense when the majority of a nation is outside of its homeland to use our local governments and try to appeal to them of our story. 90% of our nation is outside of diaspora, and so the work has to become from diaspora, and we all have to work together. We all have to work in uh, appealing to our governments and appealing to our local leaders, because the Circassian issue is an international issue, and we must work with other people, with other groups, and not be afraid of telling our story. What had happened to us in the, is in the past, and it is very tragic and very sorrowful, but the only way for us to move forward is if we can try to figure out ways, try to figure out creative ways to work together and to bring our message even further. And I think one last thing I'd like to cap off this particular conversation with is we are a nonviolent campaign, we are nonviolent people, and we are only pursuing nonviolent means of recognition. And this isn't some nationalistic, you know, separatist movement we're talking about. If Russia were able to reach out and create a harmonious space in the Caucasus for Circassians in diaspora to return, okay, they've been spending $51 billion on these Olympics. If they reached out and spent a few million to rebuild villages like they did in the 90s for the Kosovo refugees, for our Syrian repatriates, then I think you would see a lot more commonality, a lot more, you know, building. They missed the mark with these Olympics. They could have really reached out and made a big difference in our relationship. They could have featured us as the main indigenous group just as Vancouver did and allowed the First Nations to host the Olympics, but they didn't do that. You know, they're including us in little minor ways to appease us, but it's not enough. Including dancing in Olympics does not talk about our rights as people. 
And so for us, we want to foster a goodwill between us and the Russian nation. And that's what this whole campaign was about, really. Putting pressure out there, be giving us a leverage to be able to speak, you know, to get some rights passed, to start a repatriation program, to allow these Syrian Circassians a route back into their homeland so that they can stay alive, so that they can thrive, so that they can take their education and build a beautiful economy in the Caucasus today. Uh, something that would be beneficial to both the Circassians and the Russians. So I think it's important to, to note that as well. It, um, <clears throat> it sounds like a win-win and, and we're getting kind of a lose-lose on, on that. So that's really a missed opportunity. I, I agree with you on that. Uh, if I, uh, we've got about uh, nine or ten minutes left. Uh, social media, uh, if, if we can just address that a little bit more because obviously anybody who's, who's uh, participating in this uh, call or, or, or watching the program uh, is, uh, is involved with social media. But uh, I've, I've been really impressed and amazed by the way that the Circassians and the No Sochi campaign has, has uh, just um, uh, really used networks to, to, to expand and, and, and talk uh, uh, to, to, discuss the, uh, you know, to discuss the issues. Uh, one of the event um, uh, tweets that uh, you you kindly retweeted yesterday uh, was um, was uh, uh, retweeted by a record number of people in, uh, in in JBank annals. So I thank you for that. We all have lessons to learn, and uh, and we'll certainly be following following on your examples. But uh, um, what do you have? Uh, in store for 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 after Sochi then as far as some of the some of the social media aspects and uh, and and Nart if you can maybe talk uh, we'll st I'll start with you but uh, but but your film I, I know that you're uh, getting it out we have the trailer as I mentioned which uh, we'll post on our on our um, on our site on our, on our Facebook event page but um, wh what are your, what are your hopes for uh, getting the film out to a larger uh, audience, especially right now. Um, well, um, my uh, understanding is that uh, uh, even though the film, uh, which is uh, about an hour and a half right now, um, for influential people who have very little time to pay attention to all these different issues and happen on a global scale, that it might be a good idea to condense it uh, into a half an hour uh, because especially if you want to show it to influential people uh, or decision makers that might be the way to go because you want to get your point across in as little time as you can uh, because many of these decision makers are very busy and they got you know, all sorts of people to meet and agendas to keep so that's that's probably what I'm going to be doing in the next couple of months, try to just uh, put that hour and a half into a half an hour um, and make it available to uh, any, any people that uh, might make a difference uh, or in spreading the message uh, you know, in a wider scale. Um, and basically, uh, you know, we have from now till May 21st, which is the 155th anniversary uh, for the, you know, the, the, the death and the expulsion from the North Caucasus. Uh, so I, would, I, have, I imagine there are going to be many events between now and that date uh, that will bring more attention to uh, the Circassians and their cause and uh, their plight, especially in Syria. Um, Samara, Donna, what about, what about you? And uh, also, just to, I've got a got a question too. If if uh, if you were to recommend a book about about Circassia, about the history, what's going on, um, what would you recommend? And and I wanted to preface that by saying that a Latvian friend of mine stopped into the office yesterday and was telling me about this great book he was reading about Circassia. Uh, and it was the one that was it's written by Oliver uh, Balo from the from the UK, if I pronounce that right. And uh, I, I know I had a, the pleasure of uh, of having dinner with him until a few years ago. I think some of you were there as well. Um, but uh, uh, what what would you recommend, and, and what are your plans for the next uh, for the next few years on on the campaign? Well, I would definitely start with Walter Richmond's Circassian Genocide. If you want, you know, hard evidence on what happened to our nation, uh, Qadir Nakhto has a book called Circassian History, which is a whole, you know. Uh, 
it's just from start to finish, it's basically. Like an encyclopedia. It's an encyclopedia. Andrew yeah. Jamoqua came out with a handbook on Circassians as well as uh, folklore on uh, Circassian culture. Um, Charles King had a book a few years ago yeah. called The um, Ghost, of Ghost of Freedom, which was also very good. And if you want to learn more about the, you know, um, insurgency aspects of the Caucasus today, I would highly recommend uh, The Thistle and the Thorn by Ahmed Akbar, who is an amazing individual. Um, we work with him very closely, and um, he's actually, um, you know, given us a lot of advice through the years, and he's been a very, very helpful person. In terms of the um, projects and you know, how is this campaign evolving? Well, the first thing we're going to be focused on this year, as Nart mentioned, um, is the 150 anniversary. Um, in terms of like ha social media style, we're hashtagging it, hashtag 150YRS. So it's a really important campaign for us. We're calling it 150. It's a very simple title. And the point of this campaign now is asking Circassians, you know, I feel like this entire time, um, no Sochi, uh, you know, had a message. It was no Sochi Olympics on the land of genocide. It was, you know, recognize the Circassian genocide, and it was free Circassian now. Now, moving forward, we're at we're, what we want to do with, with the 150 campaign is ask Circassians, you know, to get much more involved in a social media um, atmosphere. You know, we're we're asking questions like, you know, what do you want to do next? What do you think should be focused on next? Um, you know, you tell us, and why don't we work on um, finding uh, resolutions together? Um, so we want it to be a lot more um, involved. We want a lot more people to voice their opinion. You know, because now that you know Sochi is over and all this work is ahead of us as a nation, it's very important that we get as many people as involved as possible. You know, we have Circassian academics all throughout the world. Um, with a lot to say, with a lot to um, give, so we would love to see them get a lot more highly involved. We'd love to see, you know, non-Circassian academics. We have a very good relationship with a man named Tiago Lopez, and he's helped us, uh, you know, greatly. I would personally love to see, you know, Circassians band together and friends of Circassians to, you know, start a, a, tr a fund of some sort so that we can get programs in initiated in different universities around the world to start focusing on genocide recognition, to have genocide recognition, um, to have genocide programs, I mean, focused on the history of Circassians, um, you know, to have... Uh, courses and universities put in. It's a really multi-dimensional plan that, you know, we're hoping to work on and there's a lot of different aspects associated with it. So it's almost like whatever you do in your real life, your day-to-day -day career, can be applied to your nation. If you're a graphic artist, you can make graphics like this that, you know, go all over the world. If you're a student studying political silence, science, excuse me, then, you know, get involved with one of these Circassian political organizations. You know, you might be the person who's sitting at a table with uh, the Committee on, um, committee on um, uh, Foreign Affairs next time. Do you know what I mean? So for us, it's very important to get the youth involved, to get them to realize that moving forward, Maybe when you're choosing, you know, your career or you're choosing a, a field to study, maybe you should think about something that relates to your Circassian people. Linguistics, for example. Circassian history, for example. Um, these are things that need to be focused on. So these are some of the projects that we're hoping to push in the next few years. Uh, that, that, uh, I was thinking that was quite a Freudian slip, political sli uh, silence. Uh, that uh, unfortunately is, is too often too often true in this uh, in this modern uh, modern world with uh, with old style uh, hard knocks tactics, uh, but also we're seeing uh, cyber silence in uh, in in uh, in our part of the world too. So it's uh, it's future challenges. Uh, well, we've come to the end of our of our time right now, and we've we've had an extra half an hour. Uh, but um, uh, I wanted to thank uh, first of all. Uh, uh, Nart Shechem for uh, being with us today and uh, for uh, telling about uh, uh, about the background of uh, Circassian, the Circassians, a uh, little bit, little bit about its film. We will uh, feature that on the uh, uh, on the website, as I said. So, uh, Nart, thanks again. Uh, Thank you. We'll be in touch. And 
Also to uh, Dana and Tamara, thank you so much for being with us. Good luck uh, tomorrow and uh, and with your campaign. We'll be watching. Uh, do send those um, do send those links to us um, uh, about the about the uh, books that you had recommended. Uh, Nart, if you have any uh, recipes you'd like to share with us, uh, pe please feel free, and we'll be posting those on the site. And also, uh, as a final word, thanks again to my colleague uh, Lita Uberta for putting the show together today. And uh, to Jay Bank and for all of our viewers uh, out there, and uh, we'll be joining you soon again. Um, please follow Jay Bank uh, on social media and uh, and know so Sochi 2014 to see what's going on right now uh, during the uh, Olympics. So thanks to everybody, and uh, that's all. See you the next time. Thank you, Charlie. Bye bye. Bye bye.